Um, so just quickly, the Milky Way structure, um, we've been over the structure of galaxies before. We know that spiral galaxies have spiral arms. That is their defining characteristic. Um, but they also have a flat disk and a galactic bulge. Um, so this overall structure is unique to uh, spiral galaxies. Elliptical galaxies are not um, confined to a flat disk, so it makes them completely different. Um, and something that you don't see in these types of images of spiral galaxies is the halo. So there's a spherical halo that surrounds the entire galaxy. It contains old stars and globular clusters. Uh, both of those are very faint features, and so that's why it doesn't show up well in visible wavelength images of other spirals. And of course, we cannot take any pictures of our own Milky Way galaxy from outside, but we can observe other spiral galaxies and suppose that the Milky Way shares many characteristics with other spirals. So that's the overall structure of the Milky Way. And when we look at this overall structure, we're looking at the light that is emitted by stars, but also by other types of matter between the stars. So this interstellar matter is a really important component of what we measure when we point our telescopes up. So for example, interstellar matter is, um, you know, permeates the space between stars. Uh, nebulae are a really good example. You've probably seen lots of beautiful Hubble images like this. And a nebula is just a cloud of gas and dust in space. So this one in particular is the Orion Nebula. It's about 1400 light years away from the sun. And um, a characteristic of this nebula in particular is that it contains bright young stars. Uh, uh, and it, this is because the nebula is actually the birthplace of stars. So these dark dusty um, clouds, they collapse into stars. And then when those stars start burning, they burn bright and hot and they um, basically cause the gas around them to glow. So this uh, gas emission is characteristically red uh, because of the atomic properties of the type of gas that is emitting that light, and that is hydrogen gas. So if you uh, try to look for images of nebulae like this, they're sometimes also called H2 regions because of the particular um, atomic transition responsible for this red color. All right, so this is one example of interstellar matter. Um, like I said, that, that dust is the kind of dark images or features on this image, whereas the red glow is where the, there is lots of hydrogen gas. So already by looking at pictures of interstellar matter, we can start to tease out what types of material are located where. Uh, the bright points, of course, those are stars. So that's a nebula. Um, there are other types of nebula. The last one was an example of a stellar nursery but this is an example of a stellar remnant. So this is a star that has exploded in a type two supernova. And when this happens to stars, they blast the um, dust and gas from their outer layers into the space around them. It's an extremely violent event. And then the core of the star the, that remains, that illuminates the surrounding gas and dust. And so this kind of filament structure, that's um, the, the exterior layers of the dead star and you can't see in the visible wavelength range the dead star within. But you, can, you know it's there because it's causing all the gas around it to glow. So it is from this new material that's blown into space when stars die that new stars are born. So this is the um, kind of cosmic recycling of interstellar matter. All right, um, I guess I didn't write it on the slide, but this is the Crab Nebula. And this, the supernova that was responsible for leaving this object behind uh, was actually seen by ancient Chinese astronomers. All right, um, kind of when we look at the, the picture of the Milky Way, we see it as a streak of light across the sky, um, but it's uh, kind of cut through by these lanes of dust. So here we're looking toward our galaxy's center um, but all this dark dust is in the way and it is blocking the starlight that we see from the rest of the stars in the disk. So the interstellar medium, it's actually a fairly low density. Um, there's only about one atom per cubic centimeter. So not very much stuff, um, you know, per volume. And of that stuff, about 90% of it is um, hydrogen, 10% helium, and trace amounts of dust, which is mostly made of carbon and silicon. 
All right. So my question for you about this interstellar matter is, if the density of this stuff is so low, then how come it is so effective at blocking starlight from the stars in our disk? All right, so there's not very much of it per unit volume, but there's a lot of volume in space. And so it ends up that there is a lot of interstellar dust out there. That's exactly the right line of reasoning. Um, the clouds are huge. So interstellar dust and gas um, is about 15% of the visible mass in the Milky Way. There's a lot of dark matter. Actually, most of it is dark matter. We'll talk about that next week. Um, but th that's the reason that something so low density can block our sights. All right, so here's an example of an interstellar cloud containing a lot of dust. So this is called Bernard 68. Um, I can't remember who it was who, when originally was see, saw this image, um, said it was a hole in heaven. Um, but it's not a hole in heaven. It's a cloud of dust in, in space blocking the starlight behind it. Um, and because there's lots of it in the galactic disk, this is the essential problem. We can't see through the dust to the stars behind. And so even though we see, um, you know, the populations of stars, we can deduce that there are in fact stars behind this cloud, even though we can't see them in the visible, right? Um, but it would be nice if we could see through that dust somehow. And there is a way. So if we look in different wavelength ranges, then it can actually permeate the dust. Whereas visible light is absorbed, uh, infrared light can actually transmit through dust clouds. And also longer wavelength light, such as radio, can as well. So instead of looking at the visible, we often look at the infrared and radio ranges in order to peek through um, the dust that's in our way. The reason for this, if you're curious, is that uh, any type of physical object tends to absorb light on the same order of uh, magnitude of its own size. And so since the dust grains are similar in size to the actual wavelength of visible light, then they tend to absorb visible light. Uh, but they're much smaller than longer wavelength light, so they don't effectively absorb those long wavelengths. All right, there's um, a very important range of radio that is really key for peeking through interstellar dust. And this is the uh, 21 centimeter wavelength radio waves. They're called, not very creatively, 21 centimeter radiation. Um, and this is also produced by hydrogen. So um, these are called H1 regions, as opposed to those red H2 regions that glow because of those young stars nearby. And we can use them to map out the location of hydrogen gas in galaxies. So as an example, here's the Triangulum Galaxy in the visible range. You can see all these red splotches. Those are the H2 regions glowing in red. Um, and when we add the uh, 21 centimeter map to this visible image, then this it's color coded here in purple. And now we can very clearly make out the spiral arms of the Triangulum Galaxy, whereas they were a lot fainter and harder to detect here in the visible. 